So here I am in the Caribbean. It's beautiful blue skies, it's warm, there's gorgeous sea all around me, and yet I'm kicking myself because I made the mistake of falling into a couple of classic Caribbean traps, even though I've been here many times before and should know better. So I'm gonna tell you about some key Caribbean traps that you should avoid to make sure that you have an incredible Caribbean trip. If you're new here, by the way, I'm Gary Bembridge, and it's my goal to make it easy and more fun to discover, plan, and enjoy unforgettable cruise vacations, including here in the Caribbean. One of the traps that many people fall into is the mistake of associating cruising the Caribbean with the big mega ships like the Royal Caribbean one behind me or Carnival Dream or over there is Carnival Mardi Gras. You do not have to cruise the Caribbean big, huge, big resort ships, although lines like Royal Caribbean, Norwegian Cruise Line and of course Carnival really built up and created the mega cruising in the Caribbean as it is now, you don't have to cruise that way. Those really broke the ground and made the Caribbean really popular. However, you can do the Caribbean however you want to do it. So for example, I have been on Caribbean trips where all the passengers on board were only from the UK. I've been on extremely formal cruise on Cunard where you were dressing up in black tie. I've been on the classic cruise line Celebrity, which is a little bit more trendy, but I've also been on a classic cruise line Holland America where it's a little bit older, it's a little bit more refined, it's, some people would argue, a bit more stuffy. I've been to, on this trip now, I'm on Oceania Marina, 1,250 passengers, and my very next trip is actually on one of the world's sort of most luxurious cruise lines that I've decided to try, and there's less than 500 people on that cruise. So don't associate the Caribbean with having to go on a big resort ship. You can do it any way you want with any size ship you want, and that's really important. Figure out the kind of experience you want. Don't fall into the trap of just defaulting to those big guys who control, if you like in many ways, the Caribbean. Another big trap that people fall into is thinking that you need to sail to the Caribbean out of Florida. Now, there are three really big ports in Florida. You've got Miami, you've got Port Everglades and Port Canaveral. And certainly the vast bulk of Caribbean cruisers do head out of those three ports. However, it can be completely chaotic. Bear in mind, I was there recently and there was nine ships on the Friday, eight ships on the Saturday, seven ships on the Sunday. So there can be anything between 15 to 20,000 people getting off the ships in the morning and another 15 to 20,000 people trying to get on those ships in Miami in one day. So it can be completely chaotic. Taxis, cars, car hire buses, and it just is pretty an unpleasant experience. Of course, the reason that Florida ports are so popular is the closest major ports to get into the Caribbean. So there is a plus side in terms of time. However, there are other considerations and options. So if you're in the United States, for example, you can sail from so many places. So Carnival have about 12 different ports they sell at various times of the year. So does Norwegian or Caribbean, about nine different ports across the United States. One slight downside is some of those smaller places, smaller cities, they put some of the older ships on, so that is a bit of a watch out. Of course, if you're coming from Europe, you don't have to come all the way to Miami. Many lines, whether it's Pino, whether it's uh, some of the German lines like TUI, Mindshift and so on, they will uh, charter flights into, say, Barbados, so you can also you know, charter direct into the Caribbean. Some other cruise lines, and it tends to be the more slightly more luxurious upmarket ones, they will also originate and sail at, say, St. Martin's or Barbados or uh, places like that. Uh, the reason that the big lines don't do that is just the logistics of getting people in and out. So don't fall into the trap of thinking you have to go out of Florida. It can be crazy. The hotels can get really expensive in places like Miami now, Fort Lauderdale hotels can be quite expensive. So it's look at different alternatives. And you don't even have to go on an English speaking cruise line. It's lines like the German Mind Shift, Aida, Italian Costa, they all head down to the Caribbean. So if you want a multicultural experience or you don't even want to do an English language experience, you can do that too. So don't just default into the American English speaking or British English speaking lines. One of the really big traps to fall into, and I've done it on this particular trip, is to keep going to the same places in the Caribbean. There's surprisingly few ports that you can actually go to in the Caribbean. And the reason for that is there's only a couple that can deal with the volume of ships and the size. So many places you'll go, you'll be places like here, Costa Maya, where I am today, where you've got four big ships in. So you've got 15,000 or more people pouring off. 
And it does mean that ports in the Caribbean have to have a key to deal with it. They have to have the infrastructure, the people, the tours. So they can just cope with these huge numbers of crowds that you can see behind me. So that does limit the amount of places you can go, but it is possible to go to places that are unique and different. It just takes a bit of planning. When you're looking at planning your Caribbean cruise, there's probably about five key itineraries that are worth knowing about. One of them is the short option, which is heading to places like the Bahamas. They tend to be three or four nights. The most popular ones of all tend to be the Eastern Caribbean and the Western Caribbean. The Western Caribbean is going to take you to places like Key West, although there's some discussion on ships calling there Cozumel, Costa Maya, Roatan, Belize, the Cayman Islands. A seven night Eastern Caribbean is going to take you to places like Bahamas, Puerto Rico, St. Martin, Antigua, Dominica, St. Lucia, St. Kitts, and the US and British Virgin Islands. Also, what's important about the East and the West is many cruise lines will alternate those. You could do a two week cruise because those other ones tend to be seven nights. The other really popular cruise is a 10-nighter out of Florida, which will go much further south. So you'll go right down to Barbados. You might even go as far as Curacao, uh, you know, right down south. Uh, the other really popular option is those cruises that will do partial transit of the Panama Canal. Again, they're about 10 nights, and they will tend to sweep right down to the south and head up through uh, the Western Caribbean to places like Roatan, Belize, and so on. So when you're looking at doing a Caribbean cruise, bear in mind that many of the ports are really, really overrun, really popular. So try and look at itineraries where you might be going to some more out of the way places, more unusual places. Now another trap, which is a difficult one and one that I'm kind of torn on is around private islands. I'm actually here on Norwegian Cruise Group's uh, Harvest Key, which is a very beautiful place. It's very pristine. In my last cruise, I went to Half Moon Key, which is the Holland America one. But all of the cruise lines have it. So Royal Caribbean has invested, I think, something like $250 million on Perfect Day at Coco Key. A princess has Princess Key, Disney has Castaway Key, and so on. Uh, so they all have them. Now, the, the thing with coming to private islands is they're very beautiful. They're very pristine. They tend to be in the Bahamas or like here in Belize. They're extremely well run. They're very slick. However, because they're cruise line owned, you're not seeing the true Caribbean. And also importantly, you're not putting money really directly into the hands of the locals. Some people would argue that it's a trap because you're basically staying within the corporate world and giving the cruise line more money. Other people say it's not a trap because it's a beautiful uh, curated experience and it's a difficult one uh, on both my last two trips I've had private islands I've enjoyed them but I'm kind of torn about whether they're a trap or not so that's something that you do need to think about one of the traps that I have tended to avoid partly because I learned the hard way the first time around is around the time to go now a lot of this will depend on your own situation but the main Caribbean season runs from around September, October time when the ships are redeployed from Alaska and the Mediterranean to the Caribbean and runs until about sort of April time when the ships are then redeployed to Alaska or the Mediterranean. So that's really a busy time because it's great weather. Of course, it's winter in the Northern Hemisphere. People want to get away. If you are traveling that time period, the best time to go that I go is either sort of from middle of November to middle of December before holiday season, before school holidays. And a great time to go is sort of from the second week of January to about the middle of February. You're gonna find lots of availability, lots of choice and really good fares, but the places are gonna be relatively quiet because it's not peak time. If you possibly can, avoid school holidays because it gets really manic, avoid spring break, avoid the Christmas break if you can, because again, it gets really busy. And then during the summer, summer's very popular because it's very hot, but take a look at the hurricane season because that can cause lots of disruptions to itineraries uh, maybe the seas were a bit more rough and stuff like that of course if you are traveling with families you're traveling with kids or teens or whatever you're going to have much less flexibility on those particular timings definitely if you possibly can try and avoid those busy times that's one trap that people fall into it'll cost you more and it'll be much busier. One of the big traps that so many people fall into in the Caribbean is shopping. You'll find there are chains everywhere you go, like Diamonds International, Effie, Del Sol Color Changing, and every single port you get off on, there will be these same chains. But even more importantly, you'll find that the cruise lines are in on the game. So on many of the cruise lines, in fact, most of the cruise lines, you'll find shopping advisors who will give talks, they'll do different promotions, incentives, to call on certain recommended stores. It's important to understand that the cruise lines uh, charge people to be part of that program. So if you're a Diamonds International, Del Sol or whoever, and you want to be part of that program, you pay cruise lines 
uh, fees and it's reported in some of the newspapers like Forbes, Washington Post have run articles which claim it's several hundred thousand dollars the cruise lines can be making. Whether the cruise lines then get various other incentives or uh, commissions from sales, I, I don't really know that. But it's really important to understand that shopping has become a huge, big business. And in many ways, the risk is that you will be almost manipulated. So if you are going to go shopping in the Caribbean, approach with care. Make sure you just want things and you understand the prices so you don't overpay and don't get swept into it. Also, very importantly, if you are looking at buying things like souvenirs, try and hunt out local craft markets because you'll find many of the souvenirs are the same, many of them made in China and they aren't that different and unique to the islands. The same applies to shopping on board cruise ships. Again, make sure that you are comparing prices on land, which of course with Wi-Fi and stuff you can do. You know, for example, I bought some fragrance uh, on board which cost $100, I thought it was a good price. I then realized that I could have bought it on the duty-free passing through to join the cruise for $75 in the airport shop. So watch out, shopping is big and it could be a really big trap to fall into. One trap that is quite hard to avoid but is one that you need to really be aware of is when it comes to excursions. Now, excursions can mount up and cost you an enormous amount of money on a Caribbean cruise. You could be spending easily as a couple $100 together or up to $200 depending on the excursion you're doing. So it can mount up a lot. There's a couple of key traps that people fall into. First of all, many people will kind of default to the cruise line excursion, which is obviously the easy thing to do. A lot of people do that in the Caribbean uh, because they know that the ship will wait. Cruise lines will only wait for people that are on their own excursions. So if you are nervous, then do that. It's important to remember that the Caribbean is very geared up to tourism and cruise ships. So there's a couple of things that you should look at as alternatives. First of all, there are aggregators like shoretrips.com, cruiseexcursions.com. What they do is you can input your itinerary, your ship, and it will bring up all the excursions as alternatives that you can do in those ports. Now they work a lot with local providers and they will normally include a guarantee to get you back to the ship on time. Now they're running these excursions every single day and they're really pretty astute now at getting people back to uh, you know, to the ship in time. The other thing to bear in mind is, as I said, these ports and the people in the ports, the population are extremely used to dealing with cruise passengers. So they, you know, the more informal sector, so the taxi drivers, local guides, they really understand what people want to do, how to get there, time to get them back. So also consider looking at those because you are going to again put more money into the hands of local people rather than the corporations or you know big providers. You're going to get more into the hands of people. But when you also go on excursions, the other thing I recommend is try not to do everything the same. You know, I've met loads of people who will go on the catamaran tour in every single place, go to the beach excursion every single place. Try and do a varied range of excursions to get a much better sense and feel of the Caribbean. Vary what you do till you get a real flavor for the feel of the Caribbean, the history of the Caribbean, the culture of the Caribbean. One big tip I've got to avoid falling into the trap of going to places that are just crazy busy on excursions is to do some research around who's going to be in port. So I'm in Cozumel today. There are two huge Royal Caribbean ships. There's a carnival ship, there's Celebrity Edge and us. However, I knew that in Cozumel today, all those ships would be here because I looked on a site called cruisetimetables.com. So when I went and decided what I was going to do, I knew that places were going to be busy. So I avoided the obvious excursions and went for something a little bit different. If you want to find out more about cruising the Caribbean, watch this video where I start off by talking about one of the things that drives me crazy about cruising the Caribbean. See you over there.